Welcome back to a brand new season of Epic Earth, where we arbitrarily decide when our season will start and stop, but continue the numbering sequence of our episodes regardless. This is season four, episode 23, Eyes to the Sky. Caw! So hit that like, follow, and subscribe button, then sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride as we take a journey around this epic earth. I found it all so fascinating, just learning all the information. Nobody told me I couldn't do it, and I loved it. And now I know how to learn. Like, this is a doable thing. You know, that's an impact that we can't ignore. Welcome, everyone. This is now our fourth season of Epic Earth, um, which is sort of whatever, arbitrary, because our seasons don't have a set number of episodes. We just sort of decide when we <laughs> want to stop recording for one season and start another. But generally, we follow the semester yeah. thing. <laughs> I think we have. Yeah. I think we have. Yeah. So um, anyway, my name is Ashley Bosa. I'm a PhD student in geosciences, if you're just joining us for the first time ever. Um, with me, I have my co-host, Ry- R- <laughs> shoot. <laughs> With me, I have my co-host, Brian Rosenblatt. Happy to be here. Who is a former alum of Boise State. He just graduated last year with his master's in geophysics. Geophysics? Yeah. (laughs) Caught. And uh, tell us what you do now, Brian. Now I'm teaching. um, I'm instructing physics labs in the uh, physics department at Boise State full-time, so an average of about 100 students a semester, and it's going pretty well. That's awesome. Yeah. And we also have our other co-host, uh, Scott Galvain. Hi, Scott. Hi, everybody. And Scott is on the verge of finishing up his master's um, in Woo. basically fluvial hydrology. Fluvial I don't know. <laughs> something with geophysics and <laughs> Hydro- acoustics and... Hydrogeophysical acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Just um, make it sound complicated. Mouthful, yeah. No, that's River great. sound. That's all it is. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we're happy to have him back with us. And today we are actually re-interviewing one of us, our special guests that we tried to interview last uh, last semester, and unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties. Um, we were robots for the recording. We sounded like robots with a wind turbine in the background. So you're not getting paid for nothing. Scott. I'm not getting paid for nothing. No. <laughs> Are you getting paid at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Technical it, difficulties. Yeah, not not great. And uh, but she has graciously uh, allowed us to re-interview her. Um, so we'd like to give a warm welcome to Nora Honkamp. Hello. Hi, everyone. And um, Nora is super awesome. This is why we have to re-interview her, because she is part of Raptor Biology Program, Um, our first time ever interviewing someone from this program here at Boise State. She's a second-year master's student. Um, She's a member of Dr. Julie Heath's lab, which studies global change ecology of birds, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about that. And she's also a board member for the BSU Ecological Research Association, which um, can you tell us a little bit about what that is or what you guys do? Yeah, the ERA, which is the acronym we use, um, is a student group for grad students that are in the biological sciences, um, geosciences, and anthropology at Boise State. And the, our whole point is just to try to like build community among the grad students. So we have social hours so we can get to know each other and also do some like professional development and networking, those kinds of things. That's awesome. Um, Well, we're glad that you're heading that in some aspect (laughs) and planning all those things. And um, she's also noted that she's a certified bird nerd, (laughs) um, which is probably very apt since you are in the raptor biology program. And it's self-assigned. I can't say I have an actual certification. <laughs> oh, shoot. I was hoping there was actually a certification yeah, that for that. follow-up question. Yeah. <laughs> How do you get one? Yeah. Mm. Just get a master's in raptor biology. Yeah. That's, that's okay. the certification. And then certify yourself. Yeah. Or just go out and watch birds for hours on end. Definitely. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so Nora, we're going to start with our first question. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what makes you, you. And now, what, what makes you, you? Okay, so I'm from Ohio. I went to undergrad at Kent State University, which is in Ohio. And then I came to Boise for grad school. I love birds. I love being outside. I'm acquiring a lot of outdoor hobbies. <laughs> yeah. Like climbing and stuff like that? Definitely climbing. Nice. I've gotten a lot into climbing since I've gotten here. Um, skiing, hiking. All the things. All the things. <laughs> Is that but, like bouldering or, or top rope or whatever? Top rope, yeah. lead. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, uh, how do you find living out here in Boise compared to Ohio? It's stellar. <laughs> I love Boise. <laughs> I think the biggest thing is just all of the open space. Like in Ohio, everything is either urban, suburban, or rural pretty much. Mm -hmm. We have parks and natural spaces, but it's nothing compared to like the BLM land out here. So just being able to drive out into the middle of nowhere and it actually be the middle of nowhere is really cool. Yeah, and literally be by yourself in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's super awesome. That's the one thing I hear a lot about the West is just dramatically different from growing up in in the east you know eastern united states is like there's so much space and it's just like ridiculous amounts of space um which is i guess something that i take for granted because i grew up on this side (laughs) actually most of us did right yeah west is best yeah (laughs) i was born in new york but i grew up on the west Yeah. yeah it's like you just you're like that's my backyard and it's like 300,000 acres <laughs> of wilderness that I get to go explore, and it's fun. Totally. Yeah, like my best, one of my best friends when I was a kid, we, we would just, their backyard was a, a, a small mountain. Like, it's just <laughs> like, they just owned all that land. That's crazy. And it was incredible as a kid to just be able to walk out and explore. Yeah. For hours and hours. <laughs> That's another thing I get uh, teased for. Uh, Ohio's not flat, but we really only have, like, hills yeah. and so I see the the foothills in Boise and I'm like oh my god look at the mountain and everybody's like no that is not a mountain <laughs> <laughs> you're like mm. don't let them kill your dreams <laughs> yeah it is to me <laughs> exactly you're like you have no idea it's all relative <laughs> Um, okay, so you're a certified bird nerd, and you're here doing an amazing program. And but what, like, what got you actually interested in bird ecology and just studying birds in general? Yeah. Um, honestly, I was like 11 or 12, and I was bored, so I went down in my basement by myself and turned on Netflix and started watching a documentary about the Birds of Paradise, which is a group of birds in um, New Guinea. And I just decided that was it. I was like, this is it. I'm gonna study birds for the rest of my life. So I went to school for zoology and I was really interested in animal behavior. And um, I wanted to study birds, but kind of like avoid conservation because that seemed Mm -hmm. really scary. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to think about like, the world's on fire, everything's ending. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But in undergrad, I had some really awesome mentors that got me really into ecology and birding, and I started to realize how important conservation is and how how the role that science plays in backing it up. So that's when I kind of started steering more towards, okay, I want to do research, and I want to do research that backs conservation efforts. That's awesome. Uh, what a cool, inspirational dream to have, <laughs> based off of one documentary. <laughs> my friends always tell me they're jealous. They're like, I changed my major yeah. three times, and you've known what you want to do since you were 11. It's not fair. Yeah, it's unique, though, <laughs> and I think it's, like, it's really special. Hold on to that for as long as you can, Definitely. forever if you can. Um, that's so awesome. So, um, okay, so now you're here at Boise State. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you're working on? through the program? Yeah, um, so I'm studying migration timing in raptor species. So I'm interested in when the birds are leaving. So every fall, the raptors will kind of start to like take off around September, October, November, 
and I'm thinking that there's certain weather conditions that might dictate that. So I'm trying to figure out what kind of things will make them leave a little bit earlier and a little bit later. However, I'm not collecting my own data. Mm -hmm. Instead, I'm using community science data from a really big project called eBird. So birders go out, they see birds and they record them, and then I'm able to use their observations to see when and where the birds are. That's really cool. Um, so can you, yeah, explain to us a little bit further about what a community scientist is, or we refer to them as citizen scientists. Yeah, yeah, so first of all, citizen science and community science are the exact same thing. Community science is becoming a little more in favor as the term to use, just because you don't have to be a citizen of a place in order to participate in this type of science. Um, so traditionally, in science, there's a researcher and they go out and they collect their data but that even if you have a research team you have a limited number of people that are able to collect the data and a limited amount of time limited resources money that kind of a thing mm -hmm. and so you can only collect a relatively small amount of data in a certain period of time community science projects are the idea is to use it's like crowdsource a lot of data from a lot of people in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. So community science projects are allowing non-trained people to basically become scientists by recording data in a certain, it's a, usually in a certain way. There is some sort of a protocol, it's just less structured than like a rigorous, okay, we go out at 8 a.m., we record for four hours, and then we're done, that kind of a thing. So there are some limitations to it. There's a lot of uh, variability in the effort that people do, like how long they go out for. And there's also a lot of bias in the places that data gets collected from, because mm -hmm. people tend to be birding near where they live. So you get a lot more data from like urban areas. Mm -hmm. But in the grand scheme of things, you get way more information on a much broader spatial and temporal scale. That's great, yeah. So does that have implications, or like, I'd assume there's like worse quality data. That, that is worse quality data than like the kind of data that like a scientist would go out and collect. How is that accounted for? Or like, yeah, what, what do you do about that? Yeah, I mean, well, number one, I think um, we need to give more credit to people, even if they aren't <laughs> trained scientists. Yeah. Um, because just because the data is limited, doesn't necessarily, and it's okay that you said worse, I get what you mean, yeah, but like, yeah. it's still good data. I do definitely have to do a lot of accounting though, mm -hmm. and so that comes down to like filtering um, the data for certain parameters, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, accounting for bias yeah. within the data analysis. So are you concerned about like them giving just wrong data in general? Yeah, okay. That's the big question. When people hear, so eBird is the project I'm working with, it's been going since 2002, and so it's pretty popular at this point. And it's a, you can use it in, I think, almost every country. So it's a global project. But a lot of people are still concerned about the reliability mm -hmm. of sightings. Mm -hmm. um, eBird has a team that's dedicated to making sure the data is as usable as possible for scientists. And so one of the really awesome things is that they've set up a network of local um, people in a, like a lot of places that are experts in the birds of that area. Okay. And they are going through the sightings and kind of like checking yeah. how okay. reasonable they are. Cool. That makes sense. Vetting the information yeah. kind of cool. Hmm. Yeah, that's really great. And what a cool way to actually collect data. Like, yeah. I would love it if some of them... Actually, there are people down in Guatemala that, that are considered citizen scientists. They are hired by the organization, but they aren't formally trained like a scientist would be. Um, but they're trained to go out and detect and say, and call in and be like, there's a lahar in the drainage and, you know, like... If, look at signals and stuff even though like that's not like their formal training so that's awesome yeah it's really cool <clears throat> to see like how you community build and then drawing in community members into the science and being like this is important your 
your participation in, in it is important because it helps us like yeah and I think that's su super awesome I think having community science and, and citizen science is such a unique way of actually doing outreach without like purposely doing outreach to communities because then you know people are going to have more trust in the science they're going to know that it actually goes through a rigorous like vetting system almost like a screening system and that like you know yeah like hey like all this data that's being collected is actually really useful for something and it, it's impactful and it influences a lot of stuff and yeah and I think it's just a great way to get people to care about the <laughs> earth absolutely participating in this and just like being out there and getting an appreciation for it yeah that's really them cool. want to take care of it so <clears throat> the the information that you're looking at is it specifically like is it regional or is it global or what? Yes, so I'm looking at across North America, so um, actually I'm just looking at the U.S. and Canada <laughs> Yeah. because the breeding ranges need to be uh, not overlapping with wintering ranges, but ideally across North America, and then I'm looking from 2002 until 2021, so almost 20 years. And you're looking at migratory patterns and how they're related to these these changes maybe in environment. And um, so do you only look at them at specific times of the year because those are when <clears throat> migrations normally take place or do you look at them year round? Mm -hmm. I'm focusing on fall departure, so when the birds are just leaving in the fall because a lot of work has already been done. Not, I mean, more work can still be done, but a lot of people have looked at spring arrival already. Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> well, we're excited to see what what you come up with. And um, yeah, I mean, have you had any like interesting preliminary results out of the database already or? Um, I've been doing, I haven't quite made it to looking at the weather data yet, but just looking at the eBird data has been really cool to see patterns of like when people are birding. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I knew there would be peaks in the spring and the fall because people get really excited about migrants and so they'll go out looking for migratory birds. Mm -hmm. But you can actually see peaks in certain days when there are like organized community science projects going on. Like there's a big one called Global Big Day. The number of lists submitted on Global Big Day is like substantially higher than any other day of the year. Oh wow! That's really cool to see. That's yeah. that's really funny because you're almost doing you're almost like taking stats on like the community scientists <laughs> instead of the birds. Like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know so much about when and where people yeah. go birding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is funny. And is it for one particular bird you said, or is it for multiple? Uh, I'm multiple? looking at like 22 different species of migratory raptor. Oh my god. That's huge. Do <laughs> yes. you know how many species of migratory raptors there are? I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. 22 is a lot, though. Yeah, is a lot. <laughs> like, 22 is how many we have in North America. Cool. Yeah. As a data set, I can't imagine dealing with that. I deal with 22 lahars in one season, and my head wants to explode. <laughs> so dealing with 22 raptor species across, like, several years and then yeah. <laughs> large data sets. Big how do you, yeah, and maybe you can explain this, but how how do you handle the data sets? Is it like an automated s system that goes through and then sort of outputs a result that, or do you have to manually go through and, and do a lot of that? Yeah, so I'm coding in R. Um, so I'm writing my own scripts and then I, the nice part, 22 species sounds intimidating, but I have it all set up to like repeat itself just with each species. Cool. So I just have to troubleshoot through it one time, and then once I get it to run with one species, I can set it, and it'll automatically do nice. all of them. Nice. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask a random question? Mm -hmm. Of course. <clears throat> so do you think that there's any connection with like the timing of birds leaving in the fall and like hydrology like how like let's say there's a year where there's like a lot of water and it's like sustaining into the fall or like there's a lot more water than a typical year would that you think that would has any research been done that like connects like trends in river discharge or like 
hydrology to bird migration? So I don't know of any studies that have already done that. I feel like this really highlights the fact that I wish I had 80 more lifetimes to go and get a degree <laughs> in like every field because it's all so connected. Right. <laughs> um, but I think, so raptors specifically, they are big animals and so they're pretty hardy when it comes to like withstanding cold temperatures, environmental things. Um, and so the thing that really drives their migration is food availability. Mm. And I imagine how much water there is in a given year probably affects like rodent populations yeah. um, and a lot of their prey species. So mm. I'd imagine that would affect when they, how long they can stick around before they decide to leave. What about fish? Ooh, it definitely depends on your species. So mm. osprey are like strictly pescivores, so okay. they definitely need the fish. Yeah, cool. And then I guess that would depend on how increased water level affects the number of fish there. Or whatnot, yeah, so. that's really cool to think about. I never like considered it from a food angle. I was just thinking <laughs> like if, I don't know, like really noisy rapids, some bird species are like drawn away from from some of the sound frequencies that rivers make, so I was thinking maybe that would contribute. That's really cool. Sounds like um, Scott and Nora need to stay around and do a PhD. <laughs> you want to collab? <laughs> collab? Yeah. DM me for a collab. Yeah. We're, talking, we're talking about animal acoustics. I'm in, too. Oh, yeah. We yeah. need a whole team of yeah. experts. I, don't look at me. I can't help you guys. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, maybe some of the fluvial stuff, but... Oh yeah, you can help. only if there's like a flash flood or something that comes down the drainage and <laughs> scares off all the birds or something. <laughs> that could be your niche right there. Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, cool. So this is all awesome. This sounds so fun and such a fun project that you got put on. Um, but can you tell us like maybe what the most fun or best thing that you have done is in your research? That I've personally done. <laughs> well, what you do, or like, <laughs> I guess. The best part about my research, um, from a personal note, I would probably talk about how much I have learned in coding and how awesome that feels. Mm-hmm. Like, it feels really powerful to be like, here's my question, here's the data, and now I'm going to figure it out, like, all by myself. I can do the stats on it. I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, but another thing that's really cool about my project is because I'm a birder and I, I use eBird and I know a lot of other people that use eBird, um, I love talking about my research to birders because they always get really excited to find out that they're, like, what they're actually contributing to. They know that their sightings go towards science, but they don't know, like, what that science actually is. So it's great to show people what they're contributing to. Yeah. Does that happen at like birding conferences? That happens like on the street. Like I was out this morning birding and I saw someone and they were talking about eBird and I was like, I actually do research with that data. So like, thanks for using eBird. And they were like, what? (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, that's like intrinsically rewarding, like, yeah, or extrinsically too, because they're like, oh, hey, you're like, (laughs) cool. My dad is actually being used by someone. Like. Super awesome. I love that. That's just like, yeah, best type of outreach possible. Going back to the first thing you said, though, how long do you think it took you to get to that feeling of being able to, like, code and answer your questions, like, well? Um, it depends on what day you're asking me this question. <laughs> if I'm having a good day with code or if I'm, like, yeah. wanting to throw my laptop out the window. Yeah, but there's definitely a day where it, it all kind of clicks and, like, you feel like you now have the ability to, like, you can figure it out even if it's a difficult day. You know? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I had a little bit of exposure to R before coming here, but I didn't really use it for like actual big projects until I got here. Mm-hmm. And I've taken three or four classes that are really focused on R at this point, and I those classes definitely help and having like really good teachers that are willing to yeah show you things but also that idea of just realizing like I can figure this out yeah. on my own yeah like Google is my best friend totally once you figure out the syntax and how to like yeah. look things up and that's where the classes come in but yeah I mean 
people are scared of coding. I was super scared of it too. And I feel like just throughout my two years of a master's degree, like you really figure it out relatively quickly. Definitely. A lot of practice though. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I know you guys both I mean, are in the same. I don't. Yeah. I didn't like code all break, but then I like yeah. started up again last week, and I'm like, oh yeah. How do I do everything again? <laughs> like, it's what, just what's like happening? playing an instrument too. Like, you yeah. can't take a break, or it's you muscle forget memory. some of it. Yeah, it's mind muscle memory. Yeah, I feel like I haven't quite hit that point where I feel oh. like on a really difficult day that I can figure stuff out. I tend to go down rabbit holes, even though I know how to look things up through the forums and stuff. It still is like. If it's something new to me and it's like a, a concept that I'm not quite comfortable with, mm. then I really struggle with it. But on other days, I'm like, oh, I totally know how to like I fix this plot, and like, that's a complex thing sometimes to like put something into your plot, right? And you're like, you just figure it out. It's crazy. It's so. such an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you can have like your worst days because of coding and your best days once you figure something out. Yeah, I actually. <laughs> Um, one of my colleagues was actually singing the other day because he was like actually getting his plots to work and it was like the most joyous thing I could have been listening to. He was just like, yes, like that's so beautiful. And then he'd like go into a song and it was just like so great. Yeah. So happy for him. I know. Right. Like it just is like an, uh, like it just like exudes all this joy and it just like is contagious at that point. Then you're like, Saman. No, <laughs> I'm not gonna. No, well, Casey's always positive. <laughs> um, actually, they all are. But um, yeah, I'm not gonna say. But. Shout out to Amon and Casey. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's super awesome, though, and well done. For it's a huge learning curve, so I think we we've, we've all been in that boat, and just gotta keep motivating each other, keep going. Um, okay, now I'm going to ask you sort of um, a funny, not funny, but like an analytical question. So like, how would you describe your work using an analogy? Okay, we've talked a lot about um, community science and how that works. So I think my analogy is going to focus on that, if that's okay. Um, you know when there's like a really famous celebrity and they've got some drama going on in their life, like maybe they're dating someone new or like they think they're cheating on their, some, something that the whole country is very interested to hear the results of. Um, they, if they have like paparazzi following them around and they'll take pictures of them <laughs> and then people try to like piece together what's going on in their lives, in their personal life, just based on these like paparazzi photos. <laughs> I really feel like that describes me with the birds because like I have people out there taking lists, writing down what birds they see, the community scientists are the paparazzi and then I'm like the super fan that's like at my computer <laughs> trying to like m make the bulletin board with all the like red string connecting yeah. what's going on. Great, you're like the TMZ of the <laughs> proper yeah. biology world. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I remember that being your analogy last time and so I'm glad it's still your analogy because I think it's, it's awesome. Nice. <laughs> what do you think um, is if you know, maybe you know, maybe you, I don't know. What's your opinion? What do you think is the most popular bird? Like the one that gets the most paparazzi that people take pictures of? Yeah. Ooh. Metaphorically, which one's the Kardashian? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure, like photography wise. The, this cracks me up though. Um, Anytime I'm out birding, people are always really excited to tell me where the bald eagles are. They're like, yeah. there's an eagle down the river. You got to keep walking just like little ways and you'll see it. And I'm like, I see so many eagles. <laughs> hey. It's not that exciting to me. Before this podcast, I told a great story about how excited I was to see some eagles. <laughs> so I feel personally attacked, but it's okay. Go very on, sorry, go. Scott. <laughs> it's an I American thing. I'm used to it. It's all good. Yeah. No, no. I appreciated your story. I just think it's funny that people get really excited. But good for them. They should be getting excited. Yeah, and I agree with you. I, but the first thing that I thought of was eagles when Ashley asked that. That's funny, yeah. I feel, well, just from a conservation side, right? Like, I mean, those are the, the types of birds that were like, pull at the heartstrings. Like, where's the eagle population? Well probably all up in Alaska but you know like it's it's exciting to see that people are like 
oh wow, like protect this like very valuable thing. And also, yeah. of course, the bald eagle represents America or the U.S. So America. Have you heard uh, the the idea that our national bird should have been the turkey? Was it Benjamin Franklin oh. that wanted it to be the turkey? Uh-huh probably would have made more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I usually see that in combination with pictures of eagles like eating out of dumpsters and stuff because they're not exactly the most pristine bird that everybody likes to think of. It. I'm making it sound like I don't like bald eagles. I love bald <laughs> eagles. I mean, it sounds like the eagle's the perfect metaphor for this country. <laughs> it's beautiful, but it sometimes has to eat out of the garbage can. Oh. That's, that's, that's life, you know? That's like, we got... We're the, Sounds like we're a great student. country. <laughs> we're a great country, Sounds but like we have the dark side. That's all I'm saying. Well, I guess when you're like inspired by birds of paradise and you're seeing like all these like <laughs> amazing plumages that are like colorful and bright and amazing, and not to say that eagles aren't really beautiful, <laughs> but like comparatively speaking, you know, maybe, yeah, I don't know. I'd rather see a bird of paradise. I'm done with seeing finches for a while. Good. Good on that end. <laughs> well, if the country bird was a turkey, does that mean we'd eat bald eagles for this? <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Oh. That's a big question. Oh my god! No. <laughs> Don't want to think about that. It'd be a very lean Thanksgiving meal. Okay. I wouldn't know. <laughs> That's the best question ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, moving on. <laughs> Let's come away from that. Yeah. Um, Okay, so Nora, like, it sounds like, you know, you do a lot of work behind the computer, which you're awesome at, and uh, probably sitting there looking at a lot of databases, but it sounds like you've also had a bit of field work experience, too, and so um, what's been your best field experience that you've had? Ever? Well, (laughs) if you want. (laughs) Um, No pressure. (laughs) My best field experience ever would probably be, um, I did an internship in Florida and so there were gators everywhere and like normally they would just leave us alone but there was one really big one that was in the middle of the road and we were driving like this huge pickup truck and instead of moving it just looked up at us and hissed and I was like oh my goodness. (laughs) Um, But probably related to birds, um, I've been doing field work with my advisor over the summer monitoring American kestrels, which are this cute little teeny falcon that sit on power lines, usually like along a road. Um, And they nest in boxes, so think of like a birdhouse, but like a really big one. Um, We go around and we like pull them out to band them and we take measurements. um, And normally there's some species that other bird species that nest in the boxes, um, most of them are invasive, except one time we had a tree swallow, which is this itty bitty little bird that likes to collect feathers from other birds, Mm -hmm. and it was building a nest in uh, one of the kestrel boxes with all of these feathers, and um, we could see, we have cameras in the boxes, so we could see that this nest was getting built, but we noticed there was like a weird shape in there and we wanted to see what it was. So we pull up to the box and put our ladder up and we open the nest box and the tree swallow had built its nest on top of another dead tree swallow. Oh, <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh. it's a grave. <laughs> <laughs> or a shrine. <laughs> wow. Did you do anything about it then? Or? So they're protected under the Migratory Bird Act, so we can't do anything. And also, didn't want to bug them. It it's wasn't a natural process, hurting anybody. Guess, yeah. They thought it was great warming material for their <laughs> True. eggs. It probably was. So. Um, wow. Interesting. <laughs> um, I feel like I remember you saying something about the American kestrels last time. Like, they look really cool. Were, were we talking about finding a photo of them and putting it on the website because they're actually really cool mm. looking birds? Yeah, they, oh, they are blue and orange. Like, oh. Oh, colors. there you yeah. go. <laughs> they're like the Boise State mascot. They should be. Not that yeah. I don't like Buster, but. Yeah. Yeah. 
Buster. We're not replacing Buster. We're just, you know. We should add in Kestrel. It's the, like, on his secondary. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that would be awesome. I'd buy all Flies the gear around for that. The stadium, you know? <laughs> oh, that'd be cool if it was actually real. Yeah, like, yeah. if we get, like, ten Kestrels and have them do, like, a coordinated show. Mm. <laughs> Air show. Air <laughs> show. <laughs> Falconry. You can yes. get a Kestrel. It's like, here's the flyover. It's just a bunch of... <laughs> Kestrels. <Yeah. laughs> That'd actually be awesome. Yeah. I'd probably go to more games if they had that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm sold. I think we should petition that. I'm sure someone will be on board. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you your first serious question. Serious question. How would you solve a scientific problem if you were from, let's say, Venus? How would I solve a scientific problem if I was from Venus? Yeah. Let's just pretend Venus had birds on it like that we discovered. Like molten armored birds. <laughs> yeah. Like Could withstand cons- methane. Yeah, and like <laughs> they flourish in the toxic gas clouds of the clouds. upper atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So if there were bird-like creatures on Venus that I wanted to know more about, um, first of all, I don't really want to be hanging out in those sulfur clouds all day long. That doesn't sound great. But it's fun in there. For you, my lungs. You're from there, though, I think. Oh, right, oh. From You've there, adapted. Yeah. Oh. Do you want it? Yeah. You can I mean, exist either there. way. Either way. Well, yeah. I think it would be <laughs> pretty sweet to harness a little bit of community science power by, uh, I'd make some bird feeders. I'm putting quotes around birds because they're aliens at this point. We don't, we can't call them birds. Um, but I would put out feeders to try to get the creatures to come to us, and then I'd set up cameras on those feeders and have people tell me what comes. Are they going to be people that, that live on Venus that you're telling, like, please communicate back to Earth with me? Or is it, like, they're people on Earth that are watching the feeders? How hard do we think it would be to get video signal to come back to Earth? <laughs> Not yeah. hard. Okay. These days, I They're don't on, like, hard if you're on the surface of Venus, I think, but maybe... Shh, anything's possible. It's definitely possible. It's definitely possible. <laughs> well, maybe not with it, the technology that we have yeah. now, but we still get video feedback from, from a lot of things that are far, far away, so... Hypothetically speaking, we get, like, really crisp, like, you know, whatever... 30 frames per second video of these American, or I was going to say American kestrel. <laughs> on <laughs> Venus. <laughs> yeah. if, any bird, if any bird could do it, it would be a kestrel. There you go. Very tough. <laughs> Even more reason to petition it as a mascot. Secondary mascot. Let me ask you an impossible question. Okay. Oh, God. I'm scared. <laughs> um, I had it. I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, okay, I got it. That's okay. <laughs> like, wait, I can't so, answer it if you don't even ask so the question. So, let's say, like, you're on a planet where there's methane-based life forms. What do you think a methane-based bird would look like? <laughs> oh, man. I told you it was impossible. I just watched Avatar 2, and so I've been <laughs> really thinking about, like, different air and how different yeah. organisms, how they would evolve and adapt to be able to breathe different things. Birds have really cool lungs. I don't know if you know this, so we have two-way lungs. The air comes in, and then we let it back out again through the same tube. Birds have one-way lungs, so it, like, comes in, travels through their body. They have some air sacs in there, which, like, hang on to a little bit of air to make them lighter when they fly. But then when it travels back out, it doesn't have to go through the same passageway that it came in. It's still, like, through their mouth and nose, but it's not... They don't have to completely expel all of the air out of their body before they bring more air in. So it's like way more efficient. Hmm. Do they still release CO2? Yeah. <laughs> it's long, yeah. Birds on our planet <laughs> oh, right. are still breathing <laughs> oxygen and letting out CO2. Cool. And well, then an interesting part of that would be like the density of the atmosphere. Because like if it's so dense, it's almost like a liquid, then <gasps> is it just fish? Like, <laughs> fish with wings. Yeah. Or like Would they wings. even fly the same? Yeah, exactly. Whoa. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine them more like bats. They're just like really erratic. <laughs> like all oh, over maybe. the place. Maybe. I have another future. question about birds. Sorry to do the 180 here. 
Do they have an exoskeleton? Do, like, <laughs> have, what do we know? <laughs> Come on. Sorry. <laughs> So, like, what do we know about bird sound? Like, what do they use it for? Like, what's... Is it communication, mating, food? Yeah, birds communicate a lot through sound. Um, and it can be for a lot of different things. So, I mean, the most well-known is that birds sing to attract mates. Um, but even if they're not doing their full song, they have other calls that mean different things. I have two really good examples. Um, so chickadees have an alarm call when there's what they perceive as danger in the area. So it could be a predator or it could be us walking underneath their tree. They'll do their alarm call, which is when they say like chickadee dee dee. And they've actually done a study and found that the number of D's in that call um, corresponds with the level of threat. So if it's something that the chickadee thinks is like an intruder, but like not that big of a deal, like maybe there's just a squirrel palling around, they'll do a whole bunch of Ds. Um, but if it's a really, something really scary, like a hawk is about to come and try to get, catch them, they'll just do one really quick D and then they'll like be quiet. And so they're warning the other, ideally, I guess the other chickadees around, but it ends up being like all the other birds. Um, yeah, you don't have a lot of danger. time to futz around with all these D's if there's a predator <laughs> that's going to eat you. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. So that's one example. And then um, it can get pretty complex and actually, like, deceptive. So blue jays, which is a species that's um, back east for me, they will kind of do the same thing where they warn that there's a predator. So they'll warn that, like, a hawk is coming. And all the other birds learn that the blue jay is warning them, and so they'll stop what they're doing and go hide. Um, but they found that blue jays will actually, once they have gained the birds in the area, once they've gained their trust, they'll like lie about there being a hawk. So they'll make the alarm call, and then all the birds leave the food that they're currently yeah. eating, and then they go down and get the food. That's so smart. Wow. Yeah. Dang. The boy who cried blue jay. I had to. I'm sorry. <laughs> the blue jay who cried hawk. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That's so much better. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> That's really interesting. That's really. So, do you know how to do bird calls, Nora? Don't worry, we won't make you do any if you don't want to, but just curious. Are you good at, at doing bird calls? No. no? <laughs> I'm not. Um, but something that's kind of handy, instead of trying to mimic birds when you're talking about them while you're out birding. Um, there are little phrases that we use to remember their song. So, for example, um, Carolina wrens are a species and they their call sounds like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. Oh. So, yeah, we have these little phrases. That's really cool. Yeah, I can imagine it gets confusing after a while. You're like, I don't know which bird and call sound I'm supposed yeah. to be using. And the biggest thing is just, like, how do you describe sound? You can't Google yeah. a bird song. Well, it's becoming more of a thing, but... Yeah. That's interesting. I feel like I had a friend when I was an undergrad, and she was in, um, like, the wildlife program, and she did um, a lot of this type of... Like, she went out, she took a class that was, like specific to bird calling and she learned a whole bunch of them which was like super cool because I would go out with her and she'd be like oh yeah this is like such and such bird and then she'd do the call for it and I was like how do you remember that (laughs) and it was like so much fun though it's like that's super cool um okay well so now we're gonna get into the segment where um we ask you to describe your research to um three sets of people uh, so this is just to give you a chance to work on your elevator pitch and how you would describe it to different demographics, basically. So the first one is, how do you describe what you do to an elementary class, like a fourth or fifth grade class? Fifth grader. Okay, I would say I want to know why birds leave in the winter so we can see if they will keep leaving at that same time or if that might change in the future. And I look at what birds people are seeing when and where, and then I check out what the weather was like when the people stopped seeing certain birds. Cool. Love it. (laughs) Basic. 
Maybe you teach him some bird like calls too. <laughs> Have a try. How about um, either like a high schooler or an undergraduate student who kind of knows about like some of the raptor biology program, but doesn't isn't like really familiar with your type of research? How would you describe it to them? Undergrad. I would say um, I'm using bird observations collected through community science to look at migratory timing of birds of prey. I will combine this with weather, weather data to determine which variables might be important for determining fall migration timing and hopefully try to predict if the migration timing will change as the climate does. Nice. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, and then lastly, of course, how would you and how do you present um, your research to a professional at a conference? Expert. Um, I'm using eBird data to assess the environmental factors associated with autumn departure timing in 22 species of migratory raptor that breed in North America. I'm hoping to identify variables related to each species' migratory timing and use these to forecast potential shifts in autumn departure under various climate change scenarios. Nice. Nailed it. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well put. I, I could understand all of that. Hey. Um, yeah. Um, so I think what we'll do is maybe we'll finish up with a couple more serious questions. Actually, one of them is really serious because I'd like to get your opinion on something. I think we talked about this last time. So what are your opinions about domestic house cats and bird populations? Ooh, okay, yeah. This is a strong opinion, and I need to preface with I have always grown up cat with cats, and I love cats. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a study done about the causes of mortality in birds and house cats, specifically like outdoor Cats that go outdoors and feral populations of domestic cats are the leading cause of bird mortality in North America, at least, by far. So a lot of birds are dying, and it's because our cats really like to kill them. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them end up on the doorstep. Yeah. I luckily have indoor cats now, so they just pretend like they're going to attack birds. <laughs> Actually, I don't even think there's birds around our complex. I, like, haven't seen a bird, which is sad. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's just too noisy, and I'm not sure if they have, like, special things on the complex to keep birds away. I don't know. But, um, yeah. Poor cats. Just kept inside, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure the one would massacre everything in sight if she got out, so. Um... Yeah, it's kind of a sad situation. I know, like, people are kind of like, you know, I think even people who are cat owners, a lot of the people that I've spoken to who let their cats go outside, like, they feel bad about it because they're like, they know that bird populations are, like, definitely declining, you know, especially, like, specific to that, like, region or that, that area. And that's even worse, right? Because, like, like I don't know, there's got to be a lot of species that are only, like, found in their little niche like mm -hmm. so um their decline is even far more impactful because then there's a lot less of them yeah. obviously um <clears throat> so yeah just like to get that from someone who actually studies birds cause yeah <laughs> I think the two kind of positive things though about um like if you do decide to s keep your cats inside um, number one, I know so many people that lose their cats or their cats get either hit by a car or a lot of really sad things can happen when your cat has free roam of the world. So keeping them inside is a good, really good way to keep your cat safe. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like it's a really good excuse to um, like get creative with ways that you can make some enrichment for your cats. And like good excuse to be like, oh, sorry, I have to go home and play with my cat so that they're not too bored. <laughs> I can't do my PhD research right now. My cats need attention. <laughs> yes, the best invention has been a laser, let me Ooh. tell you. Those are definitely the cat's favorites, though. So. Um, cool. 
So I think this is a pretty obvious question to ask you, but which would you prefer to have as your roommate, a goat or a bird? <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, hold on. I see perks to both. <laughs> All right, I'm into it. <laughs> um, birds are birds are noisy mm-hmm. and messy. They like chewing on. Th- well, I have pet birds. That's how I know these things. Mm. Um, I feel like a goat is also all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they would eat if I have, like, leftovers that I don't want in the fridge. I'm like, could you just, like, take care of these for me? Chew. <laughs> no And the plate that they're on, so. <laughs> <laughs> just give them, give me the leftovers, damn. <laughs> no. Scott can definitely be that person. Um, okay, so we've got some pros and cons. But, I mean, I'm a bird lover all the way. I'd probably pick a bird. Maybe a little bit easier to have in the house. Than yeah, they do take up less what you know, bird? space. What bird would I have as a roommate? Oh, ooh, a bower bird. They like make very intricate little nests on the ground and they collect shiny things. <laughs> so I feel like they'd be really tidy and have cool yeah. collections. You might steal your stuff. <laughs> oh, that is a downside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And where did my brush go? Yeah. <laughs> Um, awesome. Okay, this is going to be really random, I'm but ready. we're into it. Okay. Um, what Disney princess would make the best spy? The best spy? Yeah. Oh, man. It's a hard one. What do you think, Scott? Literally the only prince I can think of is Aladdin. Oh, Pr- princess? Prince? princess? Oh, princess. Yeah. I heard prince, sorry. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Although he'd probably make a good spy, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, magic carpet. Like, are you Fair. kidding me? Like, <laughs> came over. <laughs> yeah, the genie. Yeah. He's not a prince, though. Or princess. Like, what what are the princesses? Of? Jasmine. Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid. Ariel. Is she a princess? Yeah, Ariel. Yeah, Ariel. Ariel. They're all princesses. The frozen, Snow White. The frozen person. Elsa and Anna, Tiana. There's tons of there's Snow White. Some new ones. Yeah. yeah, there's some new ones. Though. Sleeping Beauty. Oh, definitely you? not Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember Rapunzel Anastasia? Yeah. Anastasia's whole thing is um, she is, well, she's actually the princess, uh, but she has amnesia and doesn't remember it. And so then she's trying to like pretend to be the princess. Oh, yeah. So I feel like she'd be really good at like putting on a disguise and telling there you a different go. story. She like doesn't remember, so she has to pretend. Yeah, for sure. Good answer. Should've. Thanks. <laughs> Aladdin like was a better one. <laughs> eh, well, <laughs> yeah, for That's the prince. <laughs> um. Do you have any songs which are, like, about birds or that are related to birds that you really like? Bird songs? Yeah. Ooh. Like, they can be mainstream or it could be, like, a really random children's song that, like, Kookaburra or something. I got one. What about that one where it's, like, the duck walks up to the lemonade <gasps> stand? <laughs> What? I've never I heard love this that song. song. <laughs> it's really annoying, but... The YouTube video that goes with it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Okay. We'll show you after. Okay. Yeah. Got some homework to do. <laughs> well, this has been a super awesome interview. Thanks for coming again, Nora, to yeah. do it. We appreciate you, and we just wanted to get your story out there because it is so epic and awesome. So thank you for coming on, and um, we look forward to hearing all about the results that you get from your research, and yeah, let's go birding sometime together. I'm ready. Let's do it. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. All right, we'll see you next time. Have an epic day. Well, that was an epic conversation. We'd like to thank all of our listeners. Tune in next time for another Epic Earth podcast. Trained scientists. Uh, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. I asked a really dumb question earlier off mic about, I thought that birds... I tried to, I meant and skeleton, but I said exoskeleton. I like I'm going to cut this all out. I know, this is not <laughs> this, I mean, Just I mean, for this context. Is good. Some of it will go in the bloopers. Just for context. Do you remember Rapunzel Anastasia? Anastasia? Oh, yeah. what, isn't that a drug? No. <laughs> oh my.
my god. Anesthesia? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Hopefully, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going in the bloopers. Oh, my god. <laughs>